Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Run. Berto Will is your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have, as usual, a great show for you today. How are my peeps doing? How are my peeps doing? Hey, uh, it turns out, well, Biden just got through speaking about trying to get all those folks to get their vaccines. Why won't people do it? If you are hearing my voice today, for all the things that you have to say about the vaccines, my friends, think about this. As I've heard somebody else say before, please read up all the side effects of Advil or Tylenol or any one of those particular vaccines, and you'll see that uh, they're kind of no different than if you were taking uh, this particular vaccine. I took the vaccine earlier on. I'm still alive. No side effects that I know about. But I know one thing. I didn't so far get COVID. And I know one thing. I protected my family. I know something else. I protected those people that came in any kind of close contact with me. In other words, it's not just about me or my values, etc. It is about how do we keep la totalidad, the entire American family safe. So let's remember that, folks. Uh, don't, don't let ideology kill you. Don't let ideology do things to you that it shouldn't do to you. Okay? It's important. It's important. Anyhow, what is the show going to be about today? Like I said, I'm going to start the show going forward by kind of telling what it's about. Today's show... Oh, I'm getting some echo. Well, I guess I need to find a way to get rid of the echo that I know not from whence it comes. Maybe I got rid of it. Okay, does anybody hear an echo? Help me out, folks. Does anybody else hear an echo? Okay, great. Okay, I guess it's something that's happening in our studio only, something that I need to fix. So um, as we go ahead and talk right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to another thing here that I think will go ahead and solve that problem. I think that it's fine. Okay, great. All right, um, continuing with the program. Uh, today's title of the show is Heat Cooks Muscles, Eddie Glau Demolishes CRC, Alarmist and Steve Mintz talk about critical race theory. And won't you know, uh, this, sh this thing that, that came out with Eddie Glaw today was great. But before I get to all of that, of course, I must talk to my dear brothers and sisters. Welcome aboard, AVQ. Welcome aboard, Bridge MCP. Welcome aboard, Rose Williams. Welcome aboard, uh, Julie Van Astel, welcome aboard. Uh, para ver quién más está aquí. E2247. And of course, we have with us uh, Deborah John. Guys, thank you for being here early, on time, all that good stuff. Michael Rudnan starts the research with I hope our civilization figures this out sooner rather than later. Egberto, please put this on the screen. He likes the screen. Let oh, I think that was in Mexico, right? I think that is happening in Mexico right now. Let's go ahead and get that on the screen for brother. Um, brother, no plastic straws, turning off your AC. Climate disaster, a result of unfettered capitalism. Uh, from your words to reality. Michael Rudin also says, climate scientists blame Exxon lobbyists for disinformation that undermines efforts to reduce emissions and global warming. Nothing changes until prison terms for ecocide for those lobbyists and executives responsible for fueling the climate disinformation that now floods our discourse. True. Bridge MCP has a good one for us. More history we didn't know. Short version. You can read longer one on Wiki. Allied military bases were set up in many places in Britain during the Second World War. And American troops uh, were stationed at a great number of these bases. Some of those American troops were African Americans, and while they were segregated by law from white troops back home in the United States, no such laws existed in Britain. 
because of this, the arrival of black troops from the United States on British soil, which started in 1942, led to a number of complications. These tensions escalated and eventually boiled over into a full-scale riot that erupted in 1943 near Lancashire, Lancashire, a riot that was called the Battle of Bammer Bridge. The pubs agreed to hang a segregation sign, but it said blacks only. Then the trouble started. Oh, wow, they pulled one on. Okay, Michael Rudnan says, Public not polluters too often pay to clean up environment. EU auditors say heavy polluters should be in prison, not laughing their way to the bank as the people bail them out. I know we in the U.S. Uh, are bad at this, but I'm surprised at Europe. Let me tell you guys something, okay? I, and when we talk about corporate personhood, I want everybody that's on right now to listen to this clearly. Corporations are a legal piece of paper that makes, and hear this well, that actually gives personhood to a company. So corporations are persons in their own right. As persons, they, they, they live and they can die, but they die in an interesting kind of a way. They can also be killed or they can be bankrupted out of existence. All the while, those people who profited from all the maldoings of that corporation, they keep the loot. I want you to understand why we talk about the corporate structure and capitalism as a failure. Because again, they can do wrong and you pay the price. Don't ever forget that. And, and this little snippet that Michael Rudnan just put out there, that they make the mess, they create Three mile, island, not three mile Island, or they create Love Canal, or they create the, the destructive benzene crisis uh, in, in uh, Pasadena, Texas. Cancer Alley. People have to pay for their own health care to get better. People have to do all these things. And if they dare sue the company, the company just goes out of business. The people who made money, a lot of money by polluting the environment, they profited. People understand the fraud. Understand the fraud. Michael Rudnan also said, what technology could reduce heat debts? Trees. At a time when climate change is making heat wave more frequent and more severe, trees are stationary superheroes. They can lower urban temperature 10 life-saving degrees. Scientists say planting a trillion trees, as many of them as possible. Of course, and you know they'll take water into their bodies as well, and they're, they become a store. And as much as they're drinking water out of the ground, they become a store because of water that would immediately, you know, what can I say? Michael Rodner, Arturo Dominguez, nothing screaming, nothing screams America like 400 shootings during Fourth of the July 4th weekend. Of course, we love our guns. Michael Rodner says, report at least 150 killed and 400 shootings over the July 4th weekend. Egberto, can you also put this on the screen? What do you want on the screen? Oh, wow, that's a big one. That's an interesting one. Okay, I'll put it on. No light at the end of the tunnel. Gun violence. I agree with that. That, that, that kind of makes sense. We are the only country that behaves like this, aren't we? Iceland ran, in, ran the world's largest trial of a short... I saw that on, on, on Common Dreams today. A shorter four-day work week. The results will not shock you. An idea worth stealing. From 2015 to 2019, Iceland ran the world's largest trial of a shorter work week. An analysis of the results was finally published this week. And surprise, surprise, everyone was happier, healthier, and more productive. Please pretend to be surprised. We're not surprised in the least. One more from Michael says, In several groups that I am in, I've seen quite a number of members sharing Occupy Democrats memes to the group. Personally, I think Occupy Democrats are crap, but I'd like to hear your opinion on them. Media bias fact check. Overall, we rate Occupy Democrats questionable due to far left-wing bias, promotion of propaganda and conspiracy, and the publication of fake news as evidenced by numerous failed fact checks. I know the owner of, uh, of um, Occupy Democrats and a lot of these other websites that he has. I won't say anything negative about it. It's Yes, it is very sensational. And I'm glad that you went ahead and looked at the 
results. One of the things I do is I make sure personally, for, for politics done right, is to always stay factual. Uh, sometimes you do have to do a little sensation to get a click because uh, having good information and nobody seeing it is not at all any good. A lot of their sensationalism comes from wanting people to see the material. But when sensationalism changes the results or changes the truth, that's a problem. And yes, fact checks have found that they've done that several times. Uh, I can tell you from, uh, from Politics and Right, which you guys are listening to, fact checked has never caught us in anything of that sort. So, uh, and, and I think I've played that several times for you before. Um, not bad in the shoulder, just trying to, uh, whenever we talk about the media, I think it is all our responsibility to try hard to let folks realize, yes, we, you can trust us, and we will make mistakes, and if we make mistakes and it's brought to us, we'll change it immediately, loudly, make everybody know that we screwed up here and we're changed. Rose Williams says, there are a whole lot of Democrat groups uh, whose only purpose seems to be get, in, get to your email as they send requests for donations. They don't seem remotely interested in listening to what the people want. Exactly. All you have to know for why what Rose just said is 100% right is right now, Democrats should be bailing down with all these progressive things that we have on uh, in the Green New Deal, etc. Why should they be doing that, ignoring Republicans? Because both Republicans and Democrats, the vast majority of Democrats and a plurality of Republicans, want the policies or at least don't care. And the reason we don't get them is not because of Republicans, it's because of Democrats. You're absolutely right. How is the 2021 census different? Racially superior white Christian nationalists and fascists uh, misuse of Europe, 1933-45, forced allied troops, 1945, to find unaccountable byproducts of corrupt rule. Okay, rule that despite tinsel at its top grew steadily, uh, worse economic conditions, starvation, malnutrition, disease, deteriorating education, lower public health. It's a shame, but it's true. All right, uh, let's see what else have we got here. What else? Julie Banastel. Sorry, I've not been here for a few days. Well, Julie, you're here today. My daughter and son-in-law uh, have been visiting. Tell them hello and introduce them to the program and tell them I'll be honored if they are new members of Politics Done Right and they continue to be with you and following the program. Please, I'd love that. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I got to get to the program, to the interview now, and then we'll get back. I'll, I'll get back to some of what you had to say. So let's go ahead and get Steve Mintz in, and then we'll move on from there. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today we have a very special topic to discuss. It's the rage of the country, the false rage, I must add, critical race theory. Well, today, known as the ethics sage, to many, with a reputation as an expert in ethics, Dr. Steve Mintz is a professor emeritus from Cal Poly State. I don't want us to spend too much time on critical race theory. Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we have a very special topic to discuss. It's the rage of the country, the false rage, I must add, critical race theory. Well, today, known as the ethics sage, to many, with a reputation as an expert in ethics, Dr. Steve Mintz is a professor emeritus from Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo. He received an accounting exemplar award from the public interest section of the American Accounting Association in 2015. His blog, Ethics Sage, was recognized as number 49 out of 100 top philosophy blogs and one of the top 30 blogs on corporate social responsibility. Steve shares insights into business ethics through his workplace ethics advice blog and special take on ethics in colleges and universities in a blog, Higher Ed Ethics Watch, that begins next month. It's a pleasure to have you on. Dr. Mintz, how are you doing today? Fine. Thank you for having me. Well, I mean, uh, you, you, you kind of made a statement in, in, in that thing there that, that um, what, what that talked about the social responsibility of corporations against Ms. Milton Friedman will not be happy with you. Uh, anyhow, 
<laughs> Anyhow, let, I can't worry about Milton. <laughs> well, I, I just thought I might bring him up because you know his his great essays in the early yes. earlier part of the twentieth century. What he had to say about the social responsibilities of corporations. Anyhow, we are here to talk about critical race theory. First of all, how do you define critical race theory? Well, it's it's uh, basically a theory that says um, there's racism in American society. It's inbred. Um, it pretty much colors everything that goes on. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a way of teaching mm -hmm. about American history and racism, discrimination, a little bit of slavery as well over a number of years. So it's part of the school's curriculum. And I think that's the controversial issue from my point of view, whether it should be or it shouldn't be. Now, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we can't deny our past. Uh, there's a lot of discrimination that's occurred over the years, still exists. There's no question about it. I think we still have some of the same challenges we've had for quite a long time. Uh, the underfunding of schools in black and minority communities comes to mind. Still some discrimination in the housing. Obviously, uh, you have to have your eyes shut to not realize there is with criminal justice, given what's happened in the last two or three years, we just had the decision in the George Floyd case. So, you know, I think the issue boils down to, is America a racist country or is it just that it has racist policies that rear its ugly head from time to time? I think that's where the debate seems to come down. And where do you land in that debate? Uh, I'd be honest with you, I'm probably somewhere in between. I recognize that there still is racism. There still are people who are against uh, Blacks and other minorities, quite frankly, simply because of the color of their skin. But on the other hand, I do recognize having been a product of the 1960s, there's been a lot of progress, not quickly enough, no doubt about it. And we need to move more quickly, especially given our past history. The last two years have been very troubling, I think, for all Americans with the number of Blacks shot in the street with no reason. And we have to come to grips with this, start a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue between all sides. And unfortunately, I don't see that happening right now. I just see a divisive country. Now, the right has uh, suddenly come up with the, the meme, the, the CRT meme, the critical race theory meme. Uh, was there some staunch change in what was being taught from K to 12 and as well as in advanced academia? Was there any major shift or change that necessitated some concern about uh, we are going through a new paradigm in which CRT is being taught and in which uh, it, it, is, it is designed to make uh, white people feel less than good people? I think it's always been taught in colleges and universities. It's nothing new in that regard. The question is whether it should be taught in K through 12. That's where the controversy arises. Should kid, children that young uh, be taught that America is a racist country? And some say no, why, you know, why make them feel badly about American history at that young age? They're very impressionable. Others say yes, it's part of our history and it should be taught. But I think in the current environment, as you pointed out at the beginning of the interview, um, the rage of the country is some parent groups getting very upset about the fact that it's now part of the curriculum or proposed to be part of the curriculum of K through 12. We had the incident in uh, Loudoun County, Virginia, where parents got very, very vocal at a school board meeting because they want to make it part of the curriculum. And that's happening more and more in schools. So I think that's the change, the teaching of CRT earlier when um, children are younger than we have done in the past. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna get more specific on that. 
in the if we take a look at how often this is mentioned on TV in mostly right wing media, etc. Um, was there really some major change in high in K through 12 curricula that actually said we are going to start teaching CRT in these schools? I, I am even in, in Virginia, it seemed to me like it wasn't CRT that was being taught just true history, right? I mean, in which there was different. I think CRT has to do with the systemic nature of racism in the country and how it infiltrates from, uh, from our criminal justice system to our economic system, et cetera. While I believe in, in K through 12, we're just learning the different facets of, of, of our country's history. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. And I think those who do not want CRT taught in K through 12 say, at least some of them do, some of them may deny that it should be taught at all, that yeah, let's teach it as part of American history. It's one element, but it's not important enough to have a major module, major segment on American history. That's what the, uh, those who don't want it taught say pretty much, although there are some that don't want it taught at all even as part of American history, they'd like it to be erased from the consciousness of young people because they argue things change sufficiently to do that. I don't agree with that, but I think that's the argument. I think it does have to be taught, call it what you will, call it critical race theory, call it systemic discrimination. It has to be taught. And I think the sooner the better. The problem is if you don't teach it in K through 12, these kids come to college and they're not sensitized to what's been going on. It makes it more difficult as a college professor for many years, when youngsters come to our college and they haven't been exposed to the basics, whether it's mathematics or economics or whatever, it makes it more difficult to teach it in college because they're taught something different or it's been ignored in their early education. And what college is supposed to do is build on a foundation of what's taught in the earlier years. So that's my problem with it. We can't just uh, you know, wash it away as if it didn't exist, especially with all the challenges we've had in the last few years. It makes it imperative even more so that it be taught. Now, his, the idea behind history many times is to ensure as well that we don't repeat the, the past mistakes that we've made. And uh, my, my concern is here that is that we don't have enough people speaking up to that effect and that if we don't if, if our kids believe the fallacy that we were magnanimous in our formation that somehow uh you know that the, first of all they don't understand why why certain communities are in the state that they're in example is uh the, the, the minuscule growth, let's see, in communities of color, the non-existent growth, let's see, in native communities are generally based on the lack of investment that had occurred through this country's inception. I mean, and that was all based on who these people were. I mean, uh, if people don't know the truth, they would actually, they can actually be co-opted into believing that there's something genetically wrong with these other people, why they are the ones who are underperformers as opposed to knowing that it's externalities that cause that. Your thought on that? No, I agree with that. I agree with what you have said. Um, the impression that sometimes left is it's the minorities who have created their own problem. Right. They haven't gotten together. They haven't uh, advanced enough, whether it's educationally or what have you, rather than looking at the systems. And I agree with you, there's not been enough investment in those areas, uh, the underfunding of schools is a tragedy. And nothing, look, we've been talking about this since the 60s. So we are talking about 50, 60 years. It seems as though we just kick the ball down the road, you know, kick the can down the road. Nothing happens. A lot of talk about it. But for whatever reason, there has been no significant change in the issues that face Black and minority communities. And it's, you know, possibly getting worse. I am a little hopeful with the change of presidential administrations will make some progress the last four years under President Trump obviously have been very troubling in that regard. And we have to uh, recover, so to speak, from that 
And it is important that social programs be putting at the front. We put it at the front of our priorities, not something we talk about and never do anything about, because that's the future of this country, especially with more minority groups, uh, immigrants and others coming into the country. We should be a welcoming country, but we should also provide the resources, the education, the social services, political fairness in our system to make that happen. So we, we want people to come here just as the immigrants came, uh, you know, 200 and so years ago. And um, it, we, we have to do this on multi levels and I don't see it happening. Economically, there has to be more investment in black and minority communities. Um, call it what you will, uh, economic development zones. It, it needs to be done. It, and the key is it needs to be a priority. We have so much wealth in this country. Question is, how are we spending it? Now, my theory is that the vast majority of people are good. And that when the vast majority of people went informed, uh, they don't necessarily have, uh, take on, you know, personally speaking, I don't want, uh, I, I don't think anyone needs to feel guilt uh, of what their ancestors did. I think they have to be cognizant of the benefits that they have in, that they have engendered from what their ancestors did and also be willing going forward to mitigate for those issues that have occurred. That's my thought. And I think decent people actually think that way. My theory is, however, that there is a class in this uh, country. And I think this, this particular class is a pathological class that actually believes that uh, if we were all to get together, if we were all to see things as they really are and become and, and, and allowed our human side to come out, that the divisions, that the, uh, the, the disparities that occur uh, would cause that small class in power its power. I think it is more than, I don't, I think it has a lot to do with the economics of the few. And I, I've always wanted to have somebody that, that writes like you do. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. And it, it is something that we have to do something about systemically. And I don't know if people should fear the results of that. I don't myself. And I do believe what you said about most people are good people, but we have to have the leaders. I always contend that right. when I talk about business ethics, you mentioned it earlier, social responsibility. We talk about the tone at the top, the ethical tone at the top. And if the leaders aren't ethical, if they don't set a good role example, role model, it doesn't really help people to develop in their thought process. And that's what we're facing in Congress all too, much, too often, I believe. The other point I'd like to make, you made an interesting point. I visited Germany a lot and I've talked to Germans. We used to have exchange programs in another university. They're quite open and above board and honest about their Nazi past. They recognize it. They almost want to celebrate it so their youngsters don't forget about it. There are all sorts of monuments to uh, Jews and other groups that were in, got involved in the Holocaust. And uh, we seem to want to sweep it under the rug, whereas they want to discuss it openly. And I think it's a great model, the German model. Look how much they've developed over the years. And they're very sensitive uh, people to that today. They're sensitive to minority groups. They were welcoming to the immigrants. Uh, back when that became quite common from the Middle East and so on. Yeah, well, I, like, I, like I said, uh, doctor, I really think it has to do, believe it or not, everything in, in America, my thoughts are, it has to do with green. And the, the idea that we won't be able to control people by having them be pitted against each other as opposed to looking to where a lot of our problems are, I think may be partially the issue. Now we're uh, running up on some time here. So what I'd like to ask you is, I, and it's the last question I always ask, what should I have asked you that I didn't? What would you like to tell our audience that, that to get out there right now? Well, in my own writings and blogs that you mentioned, I like to link the teaching of critical race theory to the cancel culture. 
because if if you come out against the critical right, uh, race theory, then you could be canceled by the community, uh, ostracized from your community. And we have to realize this is all part of one problem. I put everything under the umbrella of the cancel culture, whether it's critical race theory, um, pro political correctness, uh, the thought police, and I could probably go on, wokeism, it all comes under the cancel culture. So in my mind, we have to deal with the bigger problem of the cancel culture. And whether this is good or this is bad and uh, how it will affect America in the future. So I try to do that in my blogs to make people aware of the links and all of these theories. So that would be the main thing I'd like to add to our discussion. Well, Dr. Steve Mintz, thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. I think you've brought a whole lot of enlightenment. And I think you're right. It's important for us to uh, take, a, take a look at the cancel culture and how it actually affects dialogue, how it also affects the ability. The, the, I, act, I believe people have to have the ability to fail, to be wrong, and then be enlightened and not have to worry about uh, being canceled, if you will, because again, that shuts down discourse in my humble opinion. Uh, even though that was your last question, I want your thought on that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We have to have open dialogue, free speech. And I agree with you on that thought. Yeah, I mean, I know in my own life, I've made mistakes. Um, and I would hate to be defined by my worst act. I mean, who among us haven't made mistakes? The key is whether I admit my mistakes. I show true remorse and I try to reform myself based on dialogue and civility, which has gone in society as well. To me, that is the key rather than canceling somebody because 20, 30 years ago, they may have said something um, stupid, ill-informed, what, is they, what have they done in their life for the last 20, 30 years? And what is the content of their character? That's what it all comes down to for me. Dr. Steve Mintz, PhD, professor discussing ethics, CRT. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you for having me. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. But I, I want to tackle something that I'm... Um, that Daniel Lado said, because it's, it's probably the shortest message he's ever written, but the most profound. Uh, when talking about what has happened to people of different hues, races, as some people would like to call it, you know what I believe about races. Um, when it comes to that, uh, people like to uh, believe for their own good, it makes them feel better if they make a statement like what Daniel Ledo has made. In other words, in talking to the professor, I said that why it is important that history is taught completely is so that when you see a particular group, the native people always living in a particularly bad condition, a large percentage of minorities, Latinos, blacks, uh, Asians living in a certain condition, it has to be known whether that is something because of their being, because of just who they are, or because of externalities, meaning the pressure that society is inherently racist, and because of that, that's what has occurred. And as you'll see in my next statement, I'll, I'll point it out completely. The fact of the matter is we have those conditions because society is inherently racist. That is not an attack on white people at all. It is an attack on the inception of this country and how it was founded and the path that we've taken thereafter. He says, it's not externalities, it is culture. Let's stop for a minute here. Uh, these are uh, people like La Daniel Ledo has pointed out, oh, what, look at black and black crimes in the ghettos or Latino, Latino crimes in the barrios. Look at that. Look at what's happening in these areas. Okay. And you want to call that somehow a cultural thing. As if we were to apply to the founders that same methodology 
and said, Oh my God, people that look like you, Brother Lado, are liable to be killers because you had no problems slaughtering natives and taking something that was theirs. You had no problems signing a contract, a lease, a, not a lease, a contract, a treaty for places like the Black Hills, and then you found out it had gold and you kicked them out by force and then took all the gold, the riches that was there in the first place. Of course, nobody put the riches there. We don't place that as, as something that is cultural to white people. We don't because it is not. It is to those particular people who believed in that kind of assassination and that kind of an evil. For those people who found no problem in cutting the you know what, off of black men if they didn't do the right thing or whipping uh, people in the field, violence against people in the field if they didn't work harder for free because they were just property. We don't put that, we don't hold that and say that you are an inherently violent person because you do that. We don't say that as you march the people, the trail of tears, where people, their, the bottom of their legs bled, where mothers and daughters died, where mothers and daughters were raped by people who looked like you. We never held that against you. So don't you ever dare look at what's happening in any particular community, whether it be a white Appalachian community and call it culture, a black African American community and call it culture, a Latino community and call it culture, an Asian community and call it culture. All these communities are victims of an economic system in which racism is the most effective tool to create those who believe the crap that allow that system to continue maiming as it does. So if I am not going to look at you, Brother Ledo, as a white man, you as a white man, my brother, and apply all that was done, the nasty things that were done in your name, in conquering, in destroying other countries, in doing all these things, we never look at your hue to say, Brother, that is endemic in people who look like you then you dare not use that on anyone else. You dare not use that on anyone else because it, 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 it remains what it has always been, nothing more than a fraud on humanity. Nothing more than a fraud on humanity, something to create dissension among people. So let's not forget it. Anyway, let's go ahead and listen to Brother Eddie Gloud and uh, Brother Joe Scarborough because he has a lot to say. I don't want us to spend too much time on critical race theory because the right wing is using that to get that animal part of the brains of white people in such a frantic that they believe Democrats somehow support this thing called critical race theory that's going to make all your beautiful white children think or believe or start hating themselves because you are made to believe that the sins of your fathers are your sins. It's nothing of the sort, and it's a lot deeper than that. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. What I want to do is have a definitive sort of discussion on it and leave it alone because talking critical race theory, what it does is it forgets that a lot of people are losing their apartments or losing their homes. It forgets that a lot of people are still earning, starving, and slave owning wa slave slave type wages. It it also points out it prevents us from seeing or prevent us from talking about all our brothers and sisters of all races and classes in. Appalachia, in the ghettos, in the barrios that are suffering, that critical race theory has in, in, in their immediacy nothing to do with their current condition. So they're using these offhand 
discussions to let folks forget the pains in their bellies, the hunger, the lack of the lack of their own personal economies, the lack of their own wealth, the living paycheck to paycheck, the losing of all these things. They want you to forget that. So they get you riled up about teaching your most, and this is targeted to white people, targeted to your white kids. Your white kids are going to be suffering because those Democrats, along with the people of color that support them and those crazy white people who support them, wants to make you feel like less. Don't buy it. Do not dear buy it. Check this discussion out on Morning Joe this morning, and it has a bit more to go, but this is important. Give me a definition of critical race theory, because it is confusing to me, and I think other people confuse it, and sometimes it's like this catch-all. Teaching slavery and critical race theory, those aren't the same things, are they? Christopher, you first. Yeah, that's absolutely right. This is one of the biggest kind of misconceptions. You can teach about slavery, discrimination, and racism without using critical race theory. Uh, critical race theory, in simple terms, is an academic discipline that holds that the United States uh, was founded on racism, white supremacy, and patriarchy, and that those forces are still at the root of our society today. Uh, critically, critical race theory reformulates the old Marxist dichotomy of oppressor and oppressed, but it replaces the class class categories of bourgeoisie and proletariat with the racial categories of white and black. And if you look at the academic literature, the critical race theorists aren't merely saying we should examine the history of racial inequality or racial injustice. They're saying things that are much deeper. They call into question the 14th Amendment, equal protection under the law. They call into question the First Amendment right to free speech. They oppose capitalism and, and believe that a system of collectivism must be implemented in order to improve society. Uh, it's not a benign philosophy about teaching racism. Uh, it's a radical philosophy that's rooted in Marxism. Marxism uh, and is frankly inappropriate as a pedagogical framework for teaching children. Critical race theory emerges within the context of law schools, uh, Joe, in response in particular to the Baki case, as folk are trying to think about the relationship between race, racism, and American law, right, the rule of law, questions of due equal, process, equal access and due process. So there's this argument that we needed to expand outward, that we, in order to understand the way race functions within the law, we need to understand these other broader historical, social, and economic Economic realities. And so there's this attempt to think about the U.S. in a very, very complex and nuanced way. And I think it's really important that your opening question actually reveals something. For, for Christopher, and, and I'm, I, if I could call you by your first name, you know, you've already stated very explicitly that this is not about the substance of critical race theory. This is about branding. You tweeted it, right? So this no. is this is an empty signifier to capture no. all of these things that that so-called are unpopular for Americans. And so part of what I want to suggest, Joe, is not about whether or not we actually get critical race theory right. That's not actually the point that Christopher and his allies are actually engaged in. What we need to be asking is why are they doing this at this point? Why are they well, making well, these arguments at these moment at this moment? Is capitalism, <laughs> if you are a capitalist, does critical race theory suggest? that you are racist and that capitalism is racist and we have to move beyond capitalism. Well, it, it certainly holds in, and let me be very clear, I'm not a critical race theory, but it certainly, as under my understanding, right. with my understanding, it certainly holds the claim that capitalism has its beginnings, right, within the context of the transatlantic slave trade. Not its beginnings, but it actually expands within the context of, of, the, of the transatlantic slave trade. So there is something called racial capitalism that involves, right, the idea that there are certain people who are disposable. And to the extent to which they are disposable because of the color of their skin, it allows for the accumulation of, of surplus value. So that's a complex argument that is tethered to not just simply critical race theory, but critical legal studies, which is also a feature of American law schools that hasn't somehow, uh, uh, you know, drawn the ire of Christopher uh, Rofo and, uh, and his allies and those folks. Uh, where they're teaching kindergartner, children as young as kindergarten that whiteness uh, is the devil and attempts to lure people into it uh, with the promise of stolen land and stolen riches. Uh, that's a book that's being used in hundreds of schools. And people don't think that's right. People want to know where it comes from. People want to know what ideologies so, well, inform it. What? They're telling people that they should feel shame, guilt, and anguish uh, because of their inborn characteristics and traits. Uh, these are the kind of lessons that I've uncovered in dozens of schools. Part of what we have to do in this moment, Joe, and we've talked about this, is to confront the 
ugliness of who we are. And part of what I hear in these sorts of arguments is this sense in which that confrontation must be one where we're comfortable, where we feel good about right. who we are, who we are after we confront it. So in some ways, I get let me let me just I'm, I'm, I'm scooting up in my chair, Joe, because I'm getting upset because we're mm -hmm. seeing right now in real time a reassertion of the lie very thing that keeps us from becoming a different America because we don't want to accept who we are. What wait, we've wait, wait, done. Wait, 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 wait. Part of what I'm thinking is that if once you concede the initial claim that America in some ways comes into being in light of this extraordinarily uh, painful reality, the contradiction that is at the heart of our beginnings, once you concede that, the way in which you begin to think right. about American exceptionalism shifts, right? Because it's not this idea that we, we are wholly innocent, that we're absolved of our sins, right. that recognizing who we are somehow con condemns us to, to hell, as it were, that right. we're being bludgeoned by, by, by our sins and made to feel guilty. That's not what we're saying at all. But we're saying that you have to confront it in order to release us into a different future. I want to say this really quickly. This sort of argument, this sort of argument is happening right now, and I want us to link it to January 6th. I want us to link it to the attack on voting rights. This is, in effect, in my view, Joe, an attempt to arrest substantive change in the country. And we give these folk the credit that they're giving, that they're making the arguments in good faith. And I don't think they are. And I'll say it to Christopher well, right to his face. I don't think this is a good faith argument, period. Okay. It's not a good faith argument, period. And I'm glad that he, that he got it. First of all, let's get one thing straight. Uh, it is okay. America, is America a racist country? Does America have laws that, that its racist past uh, still cre creates the problems that, that we have today? The categorical fact-based answer is yes. Are all Americans racist? The categorical fact-based answer is no. But again, the structures of this country was built on all these different things. The structures of this country was built, honestly, the, uh, the, the uh, Rufo tries to say, oh, they're teaching our kids that we stole land. Yes, because that is what happened. We are teaching our kids that we treated other people wrongly. Yes, because that's what's happening. What has happened? And if you teach the wrongs, you don't repeat them. That's why we have history. Uh, is capitalism a racist structure the way it's implemented in America? Of course it is. The initiation of capitalism was the, what the doctor calls the disposability of certain people of a particular hue. The fact that you could have, okay, because you are black, you're a slave, that's an economic structure based on capital. You, Mr. Slave, was a piece of capital used to enrich another person not of your hue. So the argument has to be made that we can honestly say who we were, who we, the parts that we continue to be, and in knowing this and wanting to be virtuous and wanting to be exceptional with our virtues, be able to change. There is absolutely nothing wrong about that. Nobody who hasn't held slaves, nobody who hasn't killed natives, nobody who hasn't run land needs to be preoccupied about that or feeling less than because of knowing the truth. What we don't want to do is have people do what they did on January 6th on a false pretense. Those were unedu those were good people and people are like better how can you call them good people these were good uneducated people who were fighting for something not to make their lives better but fighting for something to keep an enriched few maintaining chaos in this country to remain enriched as they the ones who fought to create disruption screwed us, including themselves, all. Let's get it, people. Let's get it. Let's work together. Let's unite the barrios, the ghettos, and Appalachia. Let's unite everybody against that institution that is maintaining the division. And Mr. Rufo, 
he is one of their mouthpieces to try to create dissension, chaos, and enmity between all these people. I hope you get that. Anyhow, we're at 53, and I just realized, thanks to Bridge MCP, that I didn't do my ass. Folks, please, if you are on YouTube, please click that Join button. Become a part of our PDR Posse. It means you're going to be a member on YouTube. Being a member on YouTube is a part of our PDR Posse. So click on that Join button on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, you can still become a member of that, that YouTube group, the PDR Posse by just going to politicsandright.com slash YouTube, politicsandright.com slash YouTube. Alternatively, you can go ahead and become a patron. We need a 1,000 patrons and a 1,000 politics uh, PDR Posse folk. So please go ahead and uh, either become a PDR Posse member through politics, uh, politicsandright.com slash YouTube or become a patron via politicsandright.com slash patron. Again, that is politicsandright.com slash patron. Patron is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Of course, we love your contributions by PayPal, politicsandright.com slash PayPal, politicsandright.com slash PayPal. You see all our t-shirts and, and hoodies and all of that we have at our store, including our books. You can get that at our store, politicsandright.com slash store, politicsandright.com slash store. And of course, I forgot to put the mugs on, but there are the mugs that we get at our store or at anywhere else having our mugs designed by Bridge MCP. And it shows that we're a program that want to speak to everybody. Yes, I am a very progressive guy. I'm way to the left. But I love my way to the right, brothers. And we don't have problems breaking bread and drinking coffee and discussing things. I think I am, not I think, I pretty much know much of us, much of what we believe in uh, is, is what most Americans want. You know, but again, the world isn't made up of just us. It's made up of other people. And that's where we actually talk about us working together to attain an ulterior goal, a goal that is good for us all. So again, folks, again, folks, please join by joining us uh, by going to politicsandright.com slash YouTube or politicsandright.com slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Contribute at politicsandright.com slash PayPal. Shop at politicsandright.com slash store. Now you can get all of our books, and let me put all our books on the screen. You can get all our books that we have at politicsandright.com slash books, politicsandright.com slash books. Let me put that on the screen as well. Okay, I don't think I saluted everybody that has come in thus far. So again, welcome aboard. Let's see. Uh, uh, welcome aboard, Mary May Wood. Welcome aboard, Daniel Ladeau. Welcome aboard, Carl Cox. How you doing, Carl? Mashed potatoes, yes. Gravy, no. Okay, whatever that means, brother. Hi, Coop333. Hi, everyone. Thrilled to catch Egberto live. Thank you so kindly for being here. Hi, Coop333. Uh, we've got, of course, uh, para ver quien más está aquí, Michael Rodden, or regular Rose William. Thank you for being here. E2247, great for being here and giving us all a great commenter. All our people today were giving very darn good commenter. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm trying to go through my list. My eyes are a little bit off, but I'm trying. I'm Deborah Jean, welcome aboard. Nanette Bird Smith, welcome aboard. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's see, Ken Masestaki, for all of those. Please, folks, do remember, however, to share our program. That is the way we actually get things done when we share, 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 share. Again, please become a part of the posse, politicsandright.com slash YouTube. Okay, folks, um, let's see. We have two minutes to go. I want to thank you for being here. I want you to always understand that all that I talk about here comes from a point of numero uno, telling the truth. Because I honestly believe if we all knew the truth, because my, my, my belief is that most people are good, my belief is also that a lot of folks are uninformed. And I think informing and reaching to the guts of people will ultimately change them all. Roberto Lewis, mi hermano, like I told you guys uh, yesterday, L Roberto came over and helped build my fence and he got some guys after he cut down a whole bunch of trees to come and pick that up and send it out. 
like I gave you guys in the whole speech yesterday, there's nothing like family, there's nothing like friends, there's nothing like community. And we had all of that over the weekend here at my home to get that fence bill. So Roberto, a, a big, big member of our PDR Posse, a member of our patron, a member of uh, buys or cups or t-shirts or books, everything. Thank you so kindly, brother. Special out to you. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? Anyhow, folks, look, I want to thank you guys for all being here. This is the end of the show. Uh, tomorrow we'll have another great one. I, I want to spend a time on and, and talk solely about economics, but I want to prepare a better dossier for it because I think we need to start uh, talking about that. My name is Egberto Willies. This is Politics Done Right. And you guys know how I am going to end this baby. I am what? Out! Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willies. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willies. Let us engage. It is politics done right. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.